Hello and welcome to the Inside Intelligence webinar series brought to you by the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features Martin Gurry on the challenge with OSINT. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's event will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Inside Intelligence playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the latter portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our moderator, Dr. Michael Ard, Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis Program. Thank you very much, everybody, and welcome today to Inside Intelligence. With us is Martin Gurry, who's a former CIA analyst and author of The Revolt of the Public. Gurry is a visiting fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and frequently writes for Discourse, City Journal, The Free Press, Unheard, and The New York Post. He serves at, as the um, he served at the National uh, the Director of National Intelligence Open Source Center in a variety of positions, including Director of Research, and we're very happy to have him here with us. Thank you very much, Martin. And um, today we're going to talk. Everybody uh, from you know you're following intelligence affairs. OSINT is the end of the hour. Uh, this is something that's being um, uh, uh, heavily emphasized by. Um, OD9 leadership, by CIA leadership, and uh, everybody wants to do more to exploit OSINT to improve our intelligence uh, and capabilities and analysis. So it's great to have here. You get your thoughts on this as an old veteran of it and uh, understanding it from, from when it was back with uh, FBIS up until uh, the present day. So uh, I'll leave, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. I'm I'm happy to be here and to to be talking about a subject that uh, I dedicated a big chunk of of my considerably long life uh, working on. And I guess what I'd like to do is start out by um, just laying out my ideas about uh, open source intelligence. A little bit of history. I'm a pretty immensely old person, so there has to be a little bit of history thrown in there. But mostly, I want to. Um, I want to focus on two of the big challenges that, that open source intelligence faces today and has always faced. One is methodological, the other one is organizational. So history, a basic question, right? Why should a government care about what the media of its geopolitical opponents is saying, right? And the answer is for many, many, many years, for a very long time, Governments didn't care about that. Uh, what changed was the experience of a number of brilliant scholars, people like Walter Lippmann, uh, during World War I. And these people were tremendously impressed, overly so, I might say, but tremendously impressed by the power of propaganda, uh, how governments could set, uh, basically tell the story of the war by persuading the public that it was what they were saying. So, um, so it became clear that it was that there was a, an advantage understanding what governments were telling their own publics, and that information was concealed inside that propaganda. For example, they would be preparing the populations for a defeat or for war, or for a purge. Um, so, in February of uh, 1941, as World War II raged in Europe and was just looming in the horizon for us. A uh, foreign monitoring information service was stood up in a temporary building on K Street, right where the um, Vietnam War Memorial is right now. And that temp Y uh, sign knocked around the premises of uh, FBIS and, and the Open Source Center for decades. These were strange people. It, it was called the, the Screwballs Division. There were some of them linguists, there were some of them analysts, there were some of them historians, there were some of them media mavens, and they took the um, the uh, collection of foreign media and they basically put out an analytic product from that. Um, after the war, and one of the, their luminaries was a guy called Alexander George, 
who was actually quite a uh, um, well-known and, and profound scholar. And, and he, after the war, got access to um, the, uh, the German archives that we had captured and did a study between uh, the predictions we had made you know, from open source media and, and the captured archives. And he came to the conclusion that uh, the predictions have been 80% correct. Now, I don't know how he came at that number. I don't even know what that means. It sounds like a low B, I don't know, um, but 80%. I will say um, on the, let me read something, on the, literally the E, the day before uh, Pearl Harbor, 6 December uh, 1941, uh, the Daily Report, of which I will mention in a minute, which is the open source material, the analysis said Japanese radio intensifies its defiant hostile tone in contrast to its behavior during earlier periods of Pacific tension, Radio Tokyo makes no peace appeals. So I guess in an alternate history movie directed by Quentin Tarantino, we would have avoided the uh, disaster at Pearl Harbor because that was a clear warning that the Japanese had given up on peace. Um, but one thing that people may want to ask about later, there is a gap between uh, intelligence and analysis and uh, policy. That's true with open sources. It's true with classified uh, intelligence, and and thereby hangs a tail. That uh, organization was converted into Foreign Broadcast Information Service and folded into the CIA in the National Security Act of 1947. The system changed from pure analysis to this. They they basically put out uh, bureaus all over the world because to to get radio, which is what was existed back then, you needed to be close to the source. So there was this vast system of, of bureaus. I was in my day um, chief of Paraguay bureau. I visited practically all the, the, the old FBIS bureaus. Um, and they would collect this mass of material, the best of which would be translated usually by people on the ground, locals, foreign locals. The best of the translations would then be put in these geographic daily reports with uh, color-coded covers. And I've forgotten many of them. I think that the Soviet Union was like a salmon color. I mm -hmm. remember Latin America was pink for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and these were tremendous uh, sources of, of uh, intelligence and information. And um, analysis, of course, came from looking at those daily reports, the questions just asked themselves. So it was like a pyramid. You went from collection to refining the collection to what are the analytic questions, right? Um, and that that was pretty much the way my young years as a as an analyst in in the old FBIS happened. And then the world changed. Literally, it felt from one day to the next as we crossed over into the new century. Um, a, a digital earthquake, let's say epicenter in Palo Alto. I don't know somewhere around there. Um, generated this tsunami of information that was unprecedented in human history, human experience. And that, those are just words. Uh, the information produced in the year 2001 doubled, doubled that of all previous history, going back to the, the cave paintings and, and the dawn of culture. The information produced in 2002 doubled 2001. That has more or less continued. If you chart it, you get something that looks like a gigantic wave. I call it the information tsunami. Um, well, the information tsunami has done a great deal of damage all over the world. Um, but let me tell you, it, if you were uh, an open source analyst, you were going crazy. You had no idea what these things were. We used to have authoritative sources. You know, like somebody asked about France, you had two newspapers. Suddenly you had hundreds of thousands, millions of sources, some of which said interesting things, but we had no way of saying what was what. So propaganda analysis predicated on the idea that uh, governments, particularly um, totalitarian governments, repeat what they say when they're about to do the thing that they did before. Yeah, and that would, in, 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 for example, the old Soviet Union and China uh, turned out to be very true. I mean, you could go 20 years, you know, a declaration of war coming up or something like that, or a purge coming up, they would use the same words. When you looked at the Communist countries, for example, Latin America, Cuba, Nicaragua, that did not work at all because they were not that structured. They were not that organized. Fidel Castro was much too clever to give away the game like that. 
So, um, and when you went to open societies, like if you wanted to cover East uh, Western Europe, as eventually we did, um, well, what do you do? And now you have this, on top of that, this, this tsunami of information. I think, and I honestly, um, I'm not sure how how the, um, uh, the, the the open source people are doing it now, but the way we were headed when I left uh, the business and the way I think should be right is you can't anymore know the individual sources. <laughs> There's literally an infinite number of sources. You map out the domains. You know, you, here you have the Iranian uh, religious web. Here we have the Iranian feminist web. Here you have the Iranian liberal web. And so you have an idea of where things are. And the process, you invert that pyramid. You don't you don't wait for the collection to ask the intelligence questions. You have to then become really, really good. But I mean, really good, and it's hard to ask the kind of questions that are going to be productive in terms of, of uh, analytic um, you know, judgments. Uh, and then you dive deep into those domains that you have mapped, and you try to find the answer to your questions there. Uh, so that's, that is a, literally a fundamental methodological change. I think the more information there is, the harder the, the job becomes for the open source center. Now, it is a fact, as N. N. Taleb says, that um, the vast majority of stuff is noise. Uh, it's not signal. But fake news is essentially propaganda, right? I mean, this is what open source analysis was set up to do. Uh, my friend, um, Andre Mir, and I recommend his book, Post Journalism, um, says the best part of fake news it's the fake part, because if somebody's just telling you something straightforwardly, you go, okay, they could be right, he could be wrong, he has access and no access, or whatever. But if somebody's lying to you, or is telling you something that isn't true, the questions get a lot more interesting, right? Why is this guy doing this? What does he expect is going to happen? Who is he aiming at? Is it at me? Is it some other audience? Who's behind him? Who's paying his his uh, salary? So. Fake news, in, in a sense, is as much the meat and potatoes of, of open source information as truth, which is, uh, God knows, a, a hard thing to obtain. Um, one thing also that the new uh, environment gives us, and which is becoming more and more important, is whereas before we covered governments, and they would make proclamations, and they would, you know, then sometimes write propaganda of their own. I mean, the old Czech communist media, which I was unfortunate enough to edit the translations. It was like from philosophy to sports was written by the same guy. Okay. I mean, there was no variety, right? So the, this was all the Czech government implanting its way of thinking on whoever wished to read that, that crap. <clears throat> so um, now the public is important because the public erupts. The public erupts that began, and we were saying this, some of us at the CIA, that, you know, you've got to pay attention to this. These people sound different online than they do in these dusty old newspapers. And they kind of laughed at us and said, who are these people? What party do they belong to? And of course, it was a very disorganized public. Then came the Arab Spring. I was out, out of there already. But, um, and proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that you could set up a Facebook page and say, let's meet in Tahrir Square on this particular day and start a revolution, all right? So um, we can monitor that now, which, whereas we could not, and it's become increasingly important. There is, I'll conclude with this and, and open up for questions because I feel like that's probably the most productive way to spend our time. So there's a methodological question that I have just addressed that the old system of collection leading to analysis has been inverted. And we have to start with the analytic question leading to essentially collection and then back to analysis. It's also an organizational issue. And I, I, any of you who go to work for uh, certainly open sources or, or intelligence agency should, should be aware of this. I mean, by the nature of the beast, uh, FBIS, F F M I F M I S F B I S the Open Source Center, whatever it's called now, I think it's Open Source Enterprise, mm -hmm. um, is a duck out of water, all right, or a fish out of water, whatever the, the saying is. Um, classified environments put a tremendous premium on high classification 
you basically are saying how important something is by how highly classified, compartmented, blah, 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 the thing is. Um, and you're bring, bringing something that is in a newspaper or in a web website uh, to the highest authorities. And why doesn't it have all kinds of stamps on it, classified? Um, it also massively handicaps open source intelligence work because in a, in a, in a um, sane world, you would you would be able to go out and talk to journalists. You would be able to uh, go out and talk to um, your foreign journalists, to talk to um, academics uh, who who have studied the media. You would be able to go out there to, uh, for example, talk to companies that that do polling and things like that. Well, if you're inside CIA, those are exactly the people you're told to stay away from, and you need a gigantic process of vetting and wavering and whatnot before you get there. The original, I think it was the um, Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission mm -hmm. that suggested, that proposed a uh, an open source center, had it set up as a, a, um, an independent directorate inside CIA. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it came in this terrible situation where uh, the open source center had a DNI mommy and a CIA daddy, and believe me, the daddy in that equation always wins. And I don't think it's been healthy. I don't think all this happened after I left. As the door was closing behind me, I could sense changes. I was there for a really great moment because after all those intelligence failures, they did really think. So I'm, I'm curious, that, I'm fascinated to hear that open sources are the flavor of the day. And that goes in wild ups and downs, wild ups and downs in my, my long career. Um, but the... Um, the law of gravity of intelligence is classification. And I can tell stories about that. And if you ask me a question, I, I will tell it, but I won't, I won't um, bother you uh, now. But I think right now, I mean, in, in the olden days, and I'll finish with this, they always said, oh, yeah, the open source, it's kind of like the niche and the background story, right? Even then it wasn't true, they very frequently would do um, accounting. So for every, you know, every large uh, intelligence um, category, like you know, Chinese or Soviet uh, military intentions or something like that. And it, for everyone back then, and I would watch these statistics and go like, nobody's watching this, right? Mm -hmm. 50 to 60% was open source, always, always. Mm -hmm. But now that we have this vast tsunami of information, and I'm here to tell you, you can find things in there. I'm not gonna name names. You can find things in there that in the old days you would have put top secret on, right? That some some daring do James Bond would have been sent out to get because it was it's, people have put stuff online that you would not believe, right? But in any case, the breadth of it is so huge that the old intelligence um, business, uh, you know, the the operations side of the business. Um, I think it's the niche now. There are some things that newspapers are never going to tell you. You know, what what do uh, our opponents' you know military hardware looks like? Sometimes actually they slip, but mostly you need somebody to give that to you, and you need operations for that. But that's niche. That's niche. Uh, everything else is is um, open source, um, and I don't think the intelligence community is ever going to pivot that way because they're too wedded. They're too wedded to classification. And with that, I'll, I'll lay it open to, to questions from uh, Michael or whoever. Uh, I have a couple of them. We'll get to our questions. Um, folks, you can put your questions in the um, chat or the Q&A, and I'll, we'll get to them in a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, Martin, thanks for kicking that off. There's a lot raise, There's a lot to, to talk about with this. Um, one, one thing that comes up was sort of institutionally, right? So FBIS had um, their own particular world, their own animus. I mean, they 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 were their own thing. I, I don't think it was that well resourced. Uh, uh, certainly not compared to other things that were prioritized. Correct. Was it, and uh, it must have been a tremendous um, wrenching experience for them to move into the internet age and all of a sudden realize, hey, we're not, we're way behind the curve here. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a, a, an actual example. Um, those of us who were, and there was, it wasn't just me, there was a bunch of smart people. I think the intelligence uh, world is just 
chock full of smart people. A lot of them have old heads, but all of them are smart. And a bunch of us younger, it wasn't me, the younger crowd that were leading us to, to look at the internet, um, we came across uh, the blogs in Egypt. Well, if you ever looked, at least in translation, uh, at the Egy Egyptian media of say, this must have been a few, just a few years before the, the um, Arab Spring, say 2007 or eight, um, it was the most boring thing you can imagine. Again, there wasn't quite the Czech press, but it was there was there was you know there was no comedy in in uh, the Egyptian media, mm -hmm. and you kind of had, came away thinking of these people as being so so sort of sour and serious and you know basically bureaucratic, and then these blogs show up, and they're hilarious. And they're talking about politics all the time in the most hilarious way. And they were in English at the time because uh, the blog software wasn't accepting the Arab the Arabic script at the, at the time. So these were people who were educated and they obviously knew English. They were all young. Uh, and, and they were saying amazing things about the regime. Amazing things. All of them anonymous. And we kind of scooped that up. And a friend of mine, who's now passed away, one of my best friends, um, Tony Alcott, wrote this paper about, well, what's this is what's happening in Egypt. And he got told, number one, you're not an Egypt person. Number two, here's your paperback. And it looked like somebody had slashed their wrist and blood on that thing. There were so many red marks on it. They never said no. They didn't have the courage to say no. This is, they just, you would have spent your entire life working out the edits. So it is very difficult for a, a system to adjust to that big a shock to the system. Uh, we, we we lived in a world of scarcity. We literally could collect everything that was important, everything. And then we translated the most important of the important, and then we published the cream of that, and then we analyzed on top of that one, right? Well, that world is just shattered. It's just blown away. That tsunami has smashed it to bits. And I can all I can tell you is when I left, um, they hadn't quite come to terms with that yet. All that expertise accumulated really doesn't mean anything. Nope. Nope, nope. I mean, a, a parallel fact to that or a parallel uh, event was, you know, when the Soviet Union imploded, um, you might have thought that people would have been dancing in the in the hallways of, of uh, CIA, but they, <laughs> there was there was mourning and rending of garments because a whole bunch of people whose expertise was the Soviet Union had no expertise anymore. You mentioned about social media and, and you know, and how uh, that created kind of this brought comedy back into media yes. and probably that's one way to look at it. And, but um, uh, what and you're thinking then how, so this is open source information. It's, yep. and so how do we, so how do we think about that more? Is this, uh, and do we need to be thinking more about deception and do our analysts need to be thinking more about deception than perhaps they did in the past? Uh, when well, I, I think the latter part of your question, no. I, I think there has always been deception. There has mm -hmm. always been deception. Like I said, a, 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 you know, terrible fox like Fidel Castro always had Cuba division going to to the left while he was heading to the right. You know, it was Cuban branch, I guess. Um, and uh, um, there's always been a, a misdirection. There's always been disinformation. We can talk about that at length. I am actually on an outlier on, on my opinion about disinformation, which is that it's not nearly as effective as people think it is. Uh, and, and Walter Lubman was wrong in, in uh, assuming that that propaganda was just kind of like injecting a, a thought into people's heads, the, the, the hyperbolic needle theory of propaganda. Um, but um, for a fact, there is. I think the problem isn't that they're trying to to deceive us or that they're they're misdirecting us. It's that there is so much. It's that there is this vast world. So whereas before you knew your sources, and we had what we called authoritative sources. Now, I mean, what's authoritative on the web varies from day to day. I mean, literally, you can have a battle, in or 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 some kind of military encounter or a terrorist attack where some girl who has been writing about fashion in her blog says, oh, this thing is happening a block away. And for three days, that girl becomes the best, most authoritative source on this terrorist attack somewhere in Pakistan. Right. I forget where it was. Um, it is. Um, it, so how do you deal with it? You have to be very nimble and you have to be very flexible 
and you have to map out your territory. They, most of the energy that used to be spent collecting, and that was considerable. I mean, we have that infrastructure of the bureaus and uh, the bureaus, you know, I had 30 people working for me in Paraguay Bureau. That was not a high priority area of South America. Um, so spend all that energy and, and money uh, mapping out the domain. You have to, It has to be constant because the internet is changing all the time. And like I said, authority and access vary depending on the event. Um, and then think, learn to think really, really good intelligence questions. That is hard. Right. I think that I'd like to get to some of that uh, more at the end, especially about, you know, your work with regard to the revolt of the public, because I think it I think it fits with this. Yeah. And so, but but I want to get to some of the questions more related to this uh, for the moment. Um, let's talk about, OK, so technology, right? I mean, this is something that um, uh, this has been moving along. And um, Felicity asks, um, how well do you think uh, in industry now can support the government in doing its uh, OSIN collection. What's needed here? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that mapping, for example, you can have uh, uh, an algorithm, an AI even, uh, that helps you map the internet much more than just having individuals kind of go back and forth. At the end, you can't completely rely on that. Um, I think at the end, uh, technology can help and, and can probably help uh, decisively in the sense of understanding the landscape. But in the end, it's about, okay, what is important to the United States government? What does that, what part of that is applicable to this massive material in, in, in the digital world? And how do we deal between the needs of the government and the collection or analysis in, in this in this uh, set. And I think analysis is the most important part. I think basically we have, the era of collection is, is gone as, as far as I'm concerned. I think what you need is sense-making, which should be in the era of sense-making. Mm -hmm. And part of why I always advocated, not particularly successfully, was that we should have stopped at, at, at OSC just saying, oh, this source, you know, the Times of London said X or, you know, Le Figaro said why, and explain to people, hey, those are pretty well-known sources, but many, many aren't. Explain to people when that source says that, what does it mean? Who is talking, right? Right. So not only make sense of the content, but make sense of the, of the, of the context uh, around that content so that the content becomes part of, oh yeah, those people always say that, or that's different. They have never said that before. Well, I think part of it too, you know, just uh, an aside, Martin, is uh, teaching people how to read, teaching young analysts how to read is, I think, is more of a priority than ever. That it, uh, reading between the lines and being able to get underneath sort of the document and what's what's the motivation behind it, it seems to me is, going, is uh, of, you know, premier importance, especially in this environment. Um, just, you know, anecdotally, I mean, this was like, when doing analysis on Mexico, you didn't spend so much time thinking about what they were saying, but why they were saying it. Why was this newspaper saying this now? Why was this columnist talking about this now? And who's he talking to? Not always the public, right? The government talking back and forth to each other through columns. I mean, things like this, this took time and it took um, expertise to develop. I don't know if we have that anymore. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, I suspect we do, but yes, and it is um, it's kind of remarkable outside of the intelligence world. Anyway, you know, you come out, it's weird, you know, when you when you leave government, particularly if you're in a classified environment, it's like there's this great big wall around you, and then a door opens and you're out here, and you go, oh, everything is different. Um, so people people tend to look at, um, for example, a news report as is it true? It's just something that is, is, can I use this because it's, it's good material, right? Mm -hmm. And never ask the questions that I basically was raised asking, which is, who's the source behind the source? What is the actual, who's the actual writer of this thing? 
what audience, you know, what, why does he use the words that he, why did it come out now and not later or not before, all right? What, what is the actual audience? What is the potential effect that this guy thought he was going to have with the audience? Is he having that effect, right? Because there are all kinds of unintentional effects. Um, I, I always, my, my best example of that is uh, the um, Pinochet presidential photo. Um, which I don't know if it worked in Chile. Maybe it worked in Chile, but the the invariable response of an American looking at that photo is laughing because he's, he's all puffed up with his chest and has this air of self-importance. He was, in the, by that photo, and by the way, we've been talking text, visuals on the web are far more important than, than a text. And he was talking visually to his audience, the Chileans, and I don't know whether they laughed or 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 not, but most of the rest of the world finds that photo unintentionally funny, and and that's another thing that that we need to probably discuss is the fact that um, the web is a triumph of the image over the printed word. Yeah, I mean, this is we're move, we're moving out of the sort of Gutenberg era. Yes, in a big web. Yeah. Okay, so uh, more questions. Uh, Miriam asks. Uh, uh, and, and Miriam, I might rephrase this a little bit, but the technical skills that analysts need now, do we need more, do they need to understand better about AI, large language models, things like that, so they can cope with this new environment? Well, I mean, the more you learn about that, obviously, the wiser you will be about the potential mistakes that those technologies can bring into their output. But no, I don't think that's necessary at all. I don't think I think there is a, 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 the analytic function, the human analytic function, has not changed probably since the days of Plato. Okay, um, I think you are looking at something that uh, appears normal, and you're finding something you know that the, the eye would gloss over. And you're finding something that is abnormal. It's something you need to focus on. That you're telling the government, well, this little report in this obscure uh, publication means a big change in policy for the government that, that produced this thing. Um, and that, I mean, I think you can get a lot of assistance with AI, but I have seen, even before you got to Google Gemini, uh, uh, I have seen a lot of very silly, silly um, pseudo-analysis churned out by AI. We need to be. We certainly do need to be cautious. And something that um, uh, uh, Jim has mentioned here in the chat as well. Um, Philip asks and it's something you referenced, and maybe, but maybe we can expand on this point. Um, can you explain what you mean by the law of gravity? Of, the law of gravity is classification. You, that's why I need to clarify. That. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I'll give you another example. I, I love this one. Um, and it, by the way, everything I say is out in the open. I am revealing no secrets, okay? All this is known material. Um, CIA used to run a class called Cuba Operations. They bragged. They thought they had the greatest operation in Cuba. And, and um, they called us up at, at my, you know, Cuba was part of my, I think I was running a branch at that time. It was part of the branch, Cuba coverage. And it was, they basically were wanted to be stoked and told how great they were doing. And we told them, well, actually, your highly classified reporting from all the people that you have in Cuba is stuff that we find in the newspapers. And click, they should, <laughs> they didn't want to hear that, right? So, um, yeah. So, within months of that, a Cuban general, I think it was, a high military person from Cuba defected and told, uh, told us every operative you have in Cuba is a double agent. Every last one of them. Um, and the then the, the Cubans put out this um, this this TV documentary in which they, I mean, everybody who had ever gone to Cuba thinking they were getting away with something, they were filmed, they were filmed picking up their clothes. I mean, it was just amazing. And um, to end the story, uh, we got a call again from the, the ops people saying, do you have that film? Uh, and, and we said, yeah, we had... We had a uh, bureau, may still have a bureau in Key West covering Cuba, nice place. Um, I I said, yeah, yeah, we have that. There was like four hours, just two document, two big documentaries. And they said, that's highly classified information. You have to treat it as classified. I said, no, no, 
Let me explain. This went out on the, the airwaves. <laughs> so basically, what I meant by the law of gravity is that um, you can hide a lot of incompetence and and uh, a lot of waste and a lot of you know gears going around for nothing behind classified walls. And if you put a top secret um, code worded stamp on it, that just wins you. You win. You 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 got the most important thing, and that never will change. I think it's, uh, at least not in this generation. Um, and it, it's hard for me to believe that anything that includes the director of operations uh, will ever be allow that to change. So because mm -hmm. that's what they do, and they're the, the soul of the organization. So uh, nothing wrong with that. But I think uh, for the reasons I gave before, we need to separate and protect open source intelligence, which in my opinion today, as I said before, and I'll repeat now, is probably far more productive than ops uh, in, in just scooping up information that is of use to, to the government of the United States. We need to protect that faculty because otherwise it gets stuck into, well, you, be, you become kind of like um, glorified admin assistants to the ops people. And, and that's sort of what was happening when I left. Uh, here's a question, organizational question from Mark. What does the IC consider as the dividing line between OSINT and human, or for that matter, cyber collection? What, what, uh, so things like closed online forums, is that human? Is that OSINT? Yeah, that's a good how question. We, how do we separate this? That's a good question. I think anything that would, that is freely given, you know, uh, is to me OSINT. Uh, if you break into a, um, and and by freely be given, I mean, for example, you know, like when the um, the yellow vests were getting ready to to explode in France, they had closed Facebook uh, groups. That to me is not privacy. That's just a way of keeping things because you could get in, right? You could just say I'm one of you and you got in. So um, if there is an express uh, and more and more, by the way, people are going in those, you know, like uh, if you go to WhatsApp, there's no way you're going to break into that. And more and more, like people in Cuba, for example, love apps, WhatsApp because the, even the government can't get in. So, um, so, but that's a good question. And, and I'm willing to admit that it's a huge, there are huge gray areas, actually, more than one. So that's good. That's a good question. And it is, um, because compared with classified intelligence work, the general public can collect OSINT, right? Oh, yeah. Of course. Uh, what distinguishes OSINT work within the IC from OSINT work outside the IC? Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you that now. I hadn't heard of that foundation that, that you mentioned to me earlier, um, Michael. Um, but um, when I was there, there was there was nothing. We were the 800-pound gorilla, and there wasn't even a one-pound baby out there. There was nothing, you know, there are people who call themselves open source and made a business out of it, but it was nothing. It, it, it just did not compare to the range, depth and reach uh, of what the open source center had. Uh, in part, I think, because nobody, nobody thought it was that important or valuable. Right. And people had, there were little services that would cover media for business or whatever, and you could subscribe to them. But that was about as, as a, Professional as a god. Um, from Jim asks, uh, say more about. Can you say more about the role of OSIN in enhancing classified collection? I mean, as a, but uh, it had been right as a. I mean, this certainly was a spur for us to point us in the direction where we can aim our classified. Uh, but also, I mean, he, had, he, you mentioned in your anecdote before, this was a way for us to find out if our clandestine stuff really was clandestine. Correct. Yeah, I mean, those guys from Cuba were putting top secret on newspaper articles. They just didn't know it. <laughs> they thought they would, because they were, they were being handed that information by, the, you know, the, the people that they were talking to in Cuba, uh, each and every one of whom was, was uh, basically a regime stooge. Sorry, I'm reading a question here. Uh, let me read it. I'll just go, I'll go, I'll fire this into the clear. Do you see a way for people working on the classified side to correct people on the OSINT side when it's definitive that the OSINT information is wrong? Could you repeat that? Okay. Um, is, there, is there a feedback loop the other way? So can the classified people 
be in touch with the Osin people. Yeah, yeah right? and should and should be and were and that was so you if you separate uh, an open source center or whatever from from say CIA, there would still need to be people in that open source center who have high classifications and have access to uh, classified materials because basically you were looking for holes in the information, right? Or, or you were looking for gaps um, or for correct correctives. You know, you, you guys reported this, but we're, we're seeing this different thing in the media. Um, so there has to be, and you have to talk, you know, there has to be a human aspect to this. So we did all the time. So yes, the answer is yes. They're the correctives both ways. And, and I mean, obviously, um, whatever you think of the importance of open sources uh, as an intelligence tool, um, everybody in this in this um, environment is, is in a single team. And so we can't just kind of go off by ourselves and be in business by ourselves. We have to talk to everybody else on the team. Jordan asked a question about uh, the challenge of collecting OSINT and Chinese targets. I don't know if you had experience with that, but maybe the question is more toward uh, collecting OSINT on closed societies or formerly closed societies. Uh, what is the best practice on that? Is there any insights you can give? You you mentioned Czechoslovakia earlier. Yeah, I mean, in the old days, we just got us, the old days were easy, right? There was We scooped up everything they had. I mean, there were tiny, tiny volumes of information. Um, and the communist countries, which historically have a, have trouble getting enough paper into their societies, hence the, the always uh, missing toilet paper when people went there, um, their press was very skinny because they didn't want to waste paper on, on words that they knew were of, of questionable significance. Um, again, it's... It's a matter of having an analytic mentality when you look at this stuff, um, and having the knowledge. And this is where you know tools can help you by maybe going back and and figuring out what has been said before. But having the knowledge of when th suddenly this noise turns into signal, something something is varied. You go away that that they haven't said that before, or they said that before this time and something happened. You know, so you have to have that that historical record in your head, and then you have to have this analytic framework that says. Who is the person, or the, the say in, in a in a in a communist party set up like China? You know, who is in head the party head that is responsible for this source, or who is the party person that over overlooks this more private source? Um, and and so have the context around the content that oftentimes is what gives it meaning. It's not the, what the thing that I said. Somebody can look at that, what they said, and they go, well, that's kind of boring. But if you know the context, you can say, no, that has never been said before. And it's a radical change that may well um, mean a, a change in policy in whatever area. So Karen asked about uh, you know, the experience of Bellingcat and wh what do you see as uh, the potential or the room for collaboration between private sector hosting experts and the U.S. government or our, our intel or security agencies. I mean, I think that would be great. I think Bellingcat does wonderful work. I mean, I, I again, I said that I was going to point out challenges. There is an organizational challenge. CIA doesn't like dealing with people who are out there in the media. Um, they are in some ways, you know, there was a, a time where CIA would task journalists I mean, way back, like in the 50s. Um, and that came out. Uh, during one of the periodic excoriations of CIA in the Senate. And basically, they are banned. CIA is banned from talking to journalists, except for very unusual circumstances. So you're going to talk to Bellingcat, your your hands are, are, are tied. So should it be done? Absolutely should be done. That would be actually an ideal world, is where you have a kind of a center, a real center uh, of open sources with a lot of you know, both technical and analytic uh, um, power attached to it. And then a, a huge ring of belling cats around it um, <laughs> that feed back and forth, yeah. right? And bring bring um, what those people always bring, which is they're, they're not inside the, um, the bureaucratic herd. And I mean, there is such a thing. And, and, CIA probably had less of it than most bureaucracies, but it is a bureaucracy. In the end, the tendency is, well, what's the word that's going to get me in trouble? What's the word that's going to make me go along? And you go with the one that's going to make you go along. 
if you're a Bellingcat, you don't care about that. So you're bringing in fresh perspectives and bureaucratic fearlessness into an environment that needs both. And this kind of leads into a question that Sebastian has here on uh, the whole issue of classification and where, for example, how, if, if you're dealing with, if you're going to deal with this in the government context, you're going to end up classifying basically all open source information, correct? Yeah, I mean, I mean if, there is if, a... If you put, you're putting the imprimatur of the organization. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is, okay, economists tell you that the, the human animal responds to incentives, right? So um, if the incentive is the higher the classification the more you succeed you, for your, whatever you're doing, piece of collection, piece of analysis, the more you have succeeded uh, with your organization and the more you will be rewarded by it, then there's a natural inflation that happens where everything, everybody wants to classify everything as highly as they can. Uh, and I can tell you, certainly when I was there and I, you would have to really show me that it's changed. Um, it was a complete, it was madness. There were things that absolutely had nothing in them that needed to be uh, classified, but they were classified because why? Because it's important. So, um, and and it has many, many aspects that are bad, not least that, you know, it creates a sense that things are being shielded for no particular reason, right? Mm -hmm. Why are you putting this, a lot of the times it was just bureaucracy, it's a bureaucratic incentive. If I'm classified, I'm good. Um, but sometimes not. Sometimes it really was, you know, to conceal something or to to basically shield it from from prying eyes. And um, and I think CIA needs to engage, and I think open source would be the perfect way to do it with the public more. Needs to engage with the public more. It used to, by the way, in the days of the daily reports. The daily reports went out to the public through a government organization called NTIS. When they tried to shut down FBIS because they thought the internet had come and we don't need you anymore, the American Federation of Scientists waded in and said, hell no, you're not going to do that, along mm -hmm. with the State Department and the Department of Defense. So I one time was given a private tour for weird reasons of, of the White House when the president was away. And I walked, this is way back, uh, Reagan era, and I walked into the press room and there were all these chairs at the press room and, and like half of them had daily reports sitting there that the, that the journalists were reading. So it, we shared with the public. We had an, that because of then um, in the 90s, we signed up to um, uh, copyright, new copyright laws. And uh, somebody, some wag said inside um, OSC that now, you know, countries that we could bomb we couldn't steal their copyright from, you know, because it would be violating this copyright agreement that, that we signed. So basically that hardly gets out to the public anymore. That needs, that needs to change. And the thrust of the questions I'm seeing here and the reactions from the audience is that they don't, you know, they, they see that, that uh, it's really hard, you know, to put the genie, keep the genie in the bottle really on this. Now, if you're going to be engaging more on OSINT and that's your priority as a, a collective IC, how how can you avoid it? Yeah, the uh, some of the questions that we have, uh, and Francis asked about: Do you agree that OSINT is not just a gap filler, but in fact is, should be integral to uh, the intelligence assessments? Oh, I think it should be more than integral. I think it should be in every issue, with some highly specialized exceptions, and there are those. It should be front and center number one. All right. Uh, and then you come in with a more specialized, um, um, you know, both ops type information and, you know, all the other technology that, that you can get. Um, because it's it's the richest by far. It's the richest. Right? I can give you top down. You can, you can see whether Putin is looking sickly or not. Uh, it gives you bottom up. You can see what the um, the people on the web in, in Russia are saying about Putin. It can give you the stuff in the middle. And then people put things online that are, like I said before, without naming names, top secret for their countries, right. I'm sure. They just do it. They just do it. Maybe sometimes they're taking a selfie and you're looking back there and there's some laboratory going on, you know. And again, I'm not going to name names, but uh, that's happened. One of the, you know, We've written intelligence reports, basically, that were OSINT reports. I mean, and, and 
uh, you know, that ha especially when global coverage, and there just wasn't a lot of um, human collection on a place, right. it wasn't prioritized. Right. So you had open, so you were just really writing those in reports. The trouble for an app for the analyst was uh, you knew that your report, the heart of it, was really open source, you know, FIBIS, what have you, newspapers. But you needed to put some, you know, you needed to spice up the yes, uh, up the uh, you know the the eggnog there. You needed to spike it a little bit with some uh, uh, clandestine reports, or else you didn't think anyone was going to take it seriously downtown. Yep. So you're trying to find something, but basically it was an open source report. Yeah. There's a lot of countries like that, that were like this. I mean, there's a knock-on effect that I will touch in because this has to do with the world of open source, not the intelligence part of it, which is that the customer for all of this, who is the precedent in olden times, was sit there and wait for you know the daily briefing every morning. Um and okay, this is CIA. This is like the, the it was like the, the president's newspaper, right? They're this very tailored to his his needs and, and his wants. Well, what's happened to newspapers? They're dying, right? And today, I mean, this happened in my time already. Was whereas before the president was told X, Y, or Z, and the president said, "Oh, that's interesting," the president would start saying things like, "Well, you know, I read something different." In this source over here, because the president also is online, okay, and he is also an, an open source collector in, of his own. So that's why I think it, it, there's a need to to uh, contextualize. In other words, yeah, Mr. President, but that source me it, it actually says these things and so, and so forth. So you don't doubt what the source has said. You explain why that source would say that, or that it's unusual that it said that. So. CIA, I think, runs the risk of if it thinks, well, we got we got the newspaper, we're the New York Times. Well, maybe so, but newspapers are not doing great. Uh, thanks, everybody. These are great questions. I have another, Martin. I want to sort of come back around to something on the the revolt of the public. You as our, you know, our American Ortega y Gasset here, right? Yes. And you're going to talk about how this fits in with what we're seeing with media and what you saw, in fact. Uh, and when you described in your book um, are, are these essentially out, you know, these outbursts of the public and they're expressing themselves to the media, but the media is also impacting on them and they're acting in ways that are unpredictable. Yep. Is there a question there? Yeah. My question I mean, is how do you analyze that when you're an at, when you're looking at an analysis, when you're looking at these events that have occurred and they've been all over the world. Right. There's, I mean, the, the patterns are very, very, um, uh, characteristic. In other words, they, they're the same in every corner of the world that these things have happened. Their occurrence, I think, is because these are complex societies and complex systems are inherently unprincipled, unpredictable, right? So you might think what's well, poor countries. We have a rich country like Chile, for example, or France, rich countries. And um, in both cases, it was a little bit of money was added to the tax on diesel fuel in France, literally pennies were added to mass transit in Chile, two healthy, wealthy society blow up. Just blow. You could not have predicted that, but you can understand it once it happens. You know what's happening. You go to the, the, the uh, social media and you see, well, these people have been here all along and they've been yelling and screaming. Like I said, those close groups, uh, groups of, uh, what were they called? Groups of rage, I think they were called in France, the the the, the um the yellow vests, um, where they would just sit around. And I got into one of them. They they would all sit around Facebook and yell at Macron. Just yell at Macron. Did that for three or four months. When they turned out, everybody said, "Who are these people? Where do they come from?" Well, they had been in Facebook for months. All right, so it's a it's a way of understanding that. And there's a there's a pattern to these groups. They don't have leaders. They don't have programs. They really don't have ideologies. They are disassociated from every established source of power, and that's on principle. They don't want to. They don't want to be tainted, uh, either with the party in office like Macron or the populists like Le Pen. You know, no, we are independent. Everybody tried to woo the yellow vest, and the yellow vest said, "No, we are none of you." So. Um, you can't predict it, and 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 that's a different conversation. I think prediction prophecy, I call it, is it, which is basically the business model for CIA is fundamentally um, 
uh, impossible to to achieve. I think when you when when tomorrow looks like yesterday, which is most of the time, uh, then okay, yeah, you predict yesterday and you're right. But when you get discontinuities, which is what the president wants, you know, uh, 9-11 or, or you know, every one of those we have missed, you know, the, from, I mean, we missed when the Soviets got the bomb, we missed when the Indians got the bomb, we missed when the Pakistanis got the bomb, we missed when the Soviet Union went out of business, for God's sakes, our top geopolitical enemy, we had no idea this was happening. Well, it really wasn't CIA's fault. You can't predict these failure cascades or these you know, hidden uh, dynamics in these complex societies. And I think explaining, not predicting, is what CIA should be doing. Sense-making. Sense-making. Right. That's a good way to wrap up for today. And uh, we want to thank, first of all, Martin for uh, Gurry for joining us. A very stimulating talk, very interesting. Also, thank all of you for uh, being with us today. Such great questions, great points made in the chat. I hope that you... Uh, Everybody takes a look. Somebody put some valuable information in there. Uh, we look forward to uh, having another Inside Intelligence for you coming down. We're going to be talking about uh, with uh, our uh, professor, Robert Clark. We'll be talking about how we do intelligence on weapons of mass destruction. That'll be coming up in a couple of months. Also, we'll be scheduling a talk on the ODNI at 20 and what is our retrospective on, on that. So please look for that. Um, and once again, uh, thanks everybody for being here and hope you have a great rest of your day.